I'm Zivy Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thanks so much for listening to my podcast. If you like what you hear, please follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and also at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thanks so much for listening. Enjoy it. Today's sponsor is The Helm, which is a lifestyle brand committed to elevating and investing in female entrepreneurs. They sell a curated selection of female-founded brands on their website that speaks to an entirety of a woman's life. They sell clothing, clean beauty, motherhood-related products, and many categories of items, all from brands founded by women. And they also have an investing arm that has invested almost $1.5 million in women-backed companies. Their website is thehelm.co, and they actually just recently featured featured this very podcast in their list of 22 podcasts by women that are worth listening to or something like that, which was very, very nice of them. Anyway, I hope you enjoy and thank you to The Helm for sponsoring. I had such a nice time talking to Tommy Butler, although I feel like when I was asking him questions, I kept making mistakes. So excuse me, because I think I was mildly sleep deprived that day. Anyway, Tommy Butler was raised in Stamford, Connecticut, and has since called many places home, including New Hampshire, San Diego, Boston, New York City, and San Francisco. A graduate of Dartmouth College and Harvard Law School, he was a Peter Taylor Fellow at the Kenyon Review Writers Workshop and is an alumnus of the Screenwriters Colony. His first screenplay, Etopia, was the winner of Showtime's Tony Cox Screenplay Competition at the Nantucket Film Festival. His debut novel is Before You Go. Welcome, Tommy. Thanks so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Hi. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's great to be here. Awesome. As uh, we were just chatting, I feel like this has been on the in the calendar for so long. So I'm just so excited to finally talk to you. <laughs> I know. I, I mean, it's a, it does feel like time is just crawling by. Yeah. How has it been having a book come out now? I mean, it's coming out in August, but I feel like this whole pandemic, I don't know. How, how has it been for you? Well, you know, it's a debut, so I haven't been through this process before. And to go through it during covid and the lockdowns, I can't even, I don't know what the norm normal would have been like anyway. And I can't imagine this is it though. It's a strange time and it's a sad time. And it's just, it's very strange for me to have something so important to me and so thrilling happening in the middle of something so terrible. I mean, just so terrible to the world. I don't know, the emotions are kind of all over the place, really. That sounds about right for basically everybody <laughs> <Right>. I know. <laughs> yeah. I'm waiting to talk to somebody who's like, I feel like my emotions are totally in check and things are great. So anyway. Good for them. No, I, I, I'm i kidding. I will not find that person. But Oh, oh, oh. I, thought I said I, I'm waiting. I'm holding my breath, in other words. Never yeah. mind. <laughs> yeah. Can you please tell listeners what Before You Go is about and also what inspired you to write it? Yeah. So before you go, I think, well, actually I can answer both with one, starting with one place. So I think what's inspired me to write it, and I think what it's kind of ultimately about, at least thematically, are, are three questions that I, I found myself asking myself as a human and also as a writer. The first was, why does life sometimes feel so hard, even when it seems like it shouldn't? And the second was, is there anything we can do about it? And the third was, if not, then what? And I found myself honestly kind of just ruminating on those questions, again, as a writer, but also as a human. And the book started to grow out of that. What I call the vignettes or the interludes, which are the smaller chapters between the main narrative, Elliot Chance's narrative, those really started to pop up in response to those questions. And so I think thematically, that's what it's about. You know, as far as the story goes, the main narrative is about a character named Elliot, who we start with in his childhood. And then we spend most of our time with him in his 20s. And it's about his struggle with those questions uh, to some extent. And then interspersed in Elliot's story are smaller, what I call vignettes, that are more fantastical, more fanciful about what happened before we all got here and how did it happen and what happens after we leave and what's happening in the future with regard to these questions. So, but I hope it all ties together pretty well by the end. It works. You pulled it (laughs) off. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. How much of Elliot's childhood mirrors your own? Like, did you have a brother? Did you ever get teased? Did you see monsters? Like, just how much, how much of your own life did you inject into this narrative? Well, the short answer is zero. It's, it's all fiction. It's not my story. But, you know, certainly I stole things here or there. So I did grow up in Connecticut and I have lived in Manhattan. So it's made it a little bit easier for me to describe things because I had experienced them personally. And I think, you know, emotionally, I didn't have to reach too far to not just tap into Elliot's story, but Sasha's and Banner's, other two other main characters. I I feel certain emotional kinship with all three of them on different levels. 
So explain to me how you got here writing your debut novel at this point in your life. So, I, and I know you've worked on short films and I watched your film Maneuver, which was really- Oh, you did? I did, yeah. I thought that was really cool. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I will look at chess in a whole new way from now on. And you went to law school. So to just give me the the like quick rundown of, of when you did what and how you ended up pursuing writing and film. And I know you won some award at Nantucket Film Festival- so how do we how do we get here? <laughs> yeah, it's been a journey, and it's still it's still being a journey. So yeah, I went to law school kind of in my in my twenties, a couple of years after college, and I've been practicing law for for a long time. That's my my job. That's my career, and that's how I've paid my rent. So I've been doing that for a long time. But writing has always been that passion. Always, I mean, I can almost say always. Really, it's, I've been fiddling with writing in one form or another since I was a teenager. So whether it started with, you know, poetry or just fanciful stuff. And then, you know, law school and early legal career takes up pretty much all of your brain. But I think in my early 30s, I started to get back into the writing a bit. And I started experimenting with longer form fiction and also with screenwriting. And it just kind of kept growing. Like the passion had never gone away and it just kind of kept growing and growing. And I, I was able to start balancing my, my career, my legal career with my writing passion, which, you know, I always kind of hoped would become a writing career, but you never count on that. You just, you just keep going and you hope. And then I started writing some long form fiction in my early thirties, but then I kind of went into screenwriting for a bit and actually learned a lot about story and structure and things in that endeavor. And then came back into long form fiction to write this book. So I'm really, I'm kind of doing both now, I've been doing both now for a number of years. But it has been a long journey and it's not over. This is hardly the end of any kind of journey. We'll see where this all goes. But I, mean, I can't tell you how exciting it is to, after you know, many years of kind of balancing these two things, to have, have this be coming out so soon. It's, it's amazing. It's, it's exciting. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. And you're a really great writer. I mean, you write, like you ref- reference poetry, but your prose is very poetic. I feel like even the way you describe thing like a rainstorm or raking leaves, this is when you can tell I'm from New York City. <laughs> I'm trying to find like a good passage. Here, I'm just going to read as like an example. The leaves fall in a mad rush, an unruly circus of yellow, orange, and red hurled down from the trees by a mutinous wind. It's easy to get lost in it. I stand at the center of our little front yard, staring up at the long-limbed giants in the roiling cauldron of sky. My eyes filled with color, my ears with the sweep of air through the branches. The sharp scent of ozone heralds distant lighting. Nothing else exists, and a long moment passes before I remember who I am or what I'm doing out here beneath the front edge of an autumn storm. I am Elliot Chance. I am nine years old. I am catching leaves with my brother. Like, what a great introduction. Like, how do you not want to like you. keep reading? Like, who is <laughs> Elliot? What's his story? Why are we reading about him? Who's his brother? And just the language. I mean, you really like capture scenery so well and emotion and then this whole like life and death. I mean, you go deep in here. This is a lot, you know. <laughs> it's a lot. It was a it's lot a to lot. write. <laughs> I bet. So something must have happened not to just like delve into your private life. And you don't, I know it's not your story, but just have you always had this relationship with sort of philosophy in a way or pondering the end or have you lost somebody close to you or like usually there's some like event I feel like when people are grappling so closely or feeling so closely the fact that life is so finite like how did you come to this? I wouldn't say there was an event that that spurred this novel on I mean I have lost people that I've loved nothing I mean you know people who were older like my dad, nobody in a tragic youthful accent, something like that. So, you know, I guess what you'd call more normal death and uh, aging and that kind of stuff, but it still breaks your heart. But, but I wouldn't say that spurred this book on, I don't know. I think it's my own experience with what I think a lot of us feel for any reason or no reason, which is just moments of sadness, moments of emptiness. Um, so it's not, I don't mean to, I don't think it's really necessarily about death, but of course death is such an integral part of life and the fact that it is finite makes it so important. But I think it's about that feeling, those feelings of, of wanting more, you know, of, of feeling like something might be missing. I'm pretty familiar with that. I don't know why, but I am. And I think as far as, you know, pondering and um, I've been doing that, gosh, I mean, my whole life, I arguably think too much and I ruminate a lot. And so whether it's writing myself or just reading philosophy and studying philosophy and studying poetry, and I think all, hopefully all those things come out at least a little bit in, in this book. And I think those influences hopefully show themselves because they are important for me. 
It's true. I didn't mean to imply the whole book was about death. I, I was just oh, trying no. to, I just yeah. feel like, and you know, perhaps it was, it's a wrong sort of hypothesis that a deep understanding of, you know, I don't know. It's almost like an extra sensitivity almost to emotion and the way we experience life and all of that. And it doesn't have to come from something horrible happening. Some people are just like that. Yeah. So yeah. Maybe I shouldn't have even implied. No, no, it's like, no, it's a totally fair question. And of course, I think often that is what triggers it, right? You, you lose something or someone and that triggers all this heartbreaking open and all these emotions and all these thoughts and questions and ponderings. But for me, I guess they just come. I don't know why they just come anyway. <laughs> what's, what's it all for? Why are we here? You know, what are we doing? Where are we going? All those things. Do you feel that the fact that you think about all those things, does it make you make decisions differently? Like, do you feel, do you keep all that in mind when you're making life decisions or small decisions or big decisions? You know, do you, is it front of mind or is it, it's sort of just like hovering over you as oh, a framework? That's, that's interesting. I'm sorry? As a framework, you know, for yeah. how you live your life. I mean, that's interesting. I guess I, I don't know. It's probably changed. It probably changes back and forth. I think probably sometimes it's very front of mind and other times not at all. Yeah, I don't know. It's a tough, I guess it would depend on which decision and which point in my life I was making and whether, but there are times where certainly, so silly example, but for, I applied to law school. So I spent a year in New York after college and I applied to law school, but for whatever reason, I knew I didn't want to go right away. I knew I needed a year, another year to myself. And so I deferred a year and went out to the beach in Southern California and lived and taught test prep and just really enjoyed myself for a year and, and, and just lived for a year. And that was a decision where these kinds of questions were very front of mind. I was thinking, I need to live. I need to live a year before I get on this, you know, this train. So sometimes, yes. Other times, no, it's more, you know, blindly reaching out in the dark for the next step. I feel like I'm like you in that I'm very aware. I feel like, you know, I've always thought about it, but I've had some, a lot of sudden deaths and tragic deaths and 9-11 loss. And I've just had like a lot of stuff, but I feel for me, at least it's very front of mind. Like there are many decisions, career decisions and, you know, whether to leave my marriage. Like I have all these big decisions that I'm always like, you only live once. Like, and it's very front of mind for me. So I'm always, I'm just like interested in how other People, yeah. you can't you can't do it in like should I go to King Collin before or after this podcast? But I mean, right. you know, should I you know should I keep marketing Pepperidge Farm cookies or should I, you know, write a novel? That's like a totally different thing. Yeah, um, no, I'm with you, and, and I actually I actually applaud that in you, but I it must, it's also kind of exhausting, right? Like it's I, I find it kind of exhausting to be constantly thinking about the big questions and how and how I should be living. Like that just gets very tiring. So. Hopefully sometimes you're just like, oh, I'm going to do it for the hell of it. But yeah, I hear you. I, I get it. I mean, I think once you're, <laughs> once you're on certain paths, as, as long as you like, like, I don't, I didn't mean to imply, I think about it every second, but I no, feel like no. to get yourself and keep yourself on a path that's going to ultimately lead you to le- the life you want, you have to not, I mean, this is sounding so hokey now. I'm sorry. <laughs> but you have to like reassess every so often based on those terms. But no, I, I, I agree. I mean, I personally agree. It's an, it's an intentional life. You want, you want to live with intent. And I mean, arguably there are people who say, no, just you know, let the wind carry you. But I'm kind of like you. I think everyone's different. I'm, I'm kind of like you. I think I live with more intention as well. Yeah. So writing about depression, when you were writing this book, did you look to other books about people who had gone through periods of time where they were depressed or had feelings like that, like Andrew Solomon or like big, you know, books that, you know, or group therapy or even support group, you know, all of that. How much research versus just intuition and introspection? What was the balance? Much more the latter, much more the latter. I mean, I remember... It's a few years ago now, but I remember reading things like The Bell Jar or, or The Hours or more, more fictional. I, didn't, I did certainly some research. There's a, there's a very powerful movie called The Bridge about people who killed themselves off the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. But I didn't do heavy, intense kind of clinical research. And this is not, that's not what I'm trying. I, I wasn't trying to write about that. I mean, I'm not an expert. You know, the, the book doesn't even use the word depression because I think it's taken on a clinical term that I don't, I'm not qualified to really speak on. So... So this is this book is not so much about Elliot. I mean, he may be depressed. I mean, I, you know, I'll let a doctor, I'll let a doctor decide that, a fictional doctor. But I, I was more interested in just the sadness and the emptiness he was feeling. Whether it's depression or not, I don't know. So I guess it came more from my own kind of instincts or feelings or and pe- other people I've known. But there was some research in there, certainly. I'll, I'll stop being a psychologist for fictional characters. 
<laughs> oh, no, it's, yeah. I mean, no, it's fair, right? Because as I, di- as I diagnose, you know, <laughs> anyway, I feel like a lot of those empty feelings, I mean, it, no, depression, I, I didn't go through the DSM. It's true for the, yeah. for the clinical. Well, no, but it's funny right? because well, it's not funny, but I mean, when we, when I was little, we used to say depressed just to mean sad or, or down or, or having the blues. But I think today it, it means a lot more than that. It's much more complicated. Yeah. So. Sort of like but no, no, I think it's fair to say, no, of course, colloquially, yeah, depression is, that's what Elliot's feeling, depressed, sure. So have you written since this book? Is writing something you do to sort out your own feelings? Like, is it something you do every day for fun? Are you working on another project? Like, did your relationship to changing right after this book? That was like 10 questions, but. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. I am writing, I am working on the next book, you know, intently. Did my relationship change? No, I mean, I'm still kind of kind of cranking the way I have been and learning and trying to grow. It does, you know, it's nice to finally break through. I mean, it's more than nice. It's fantastic. And it makes you feel great. And it is, it's a great vote of confidence, no matter what happens with the book. But at the same time, you don't want to let that go to your head. I want to keep, keep learning and keep realizing how much I have to learn. And so that's, I think, all staying the same. I, I do write, I do, you know, write personal journals and poetry a little bit here and there for my personal stuff, but not on a terribly regular basis. But yeah, so I'm pretty deep in the next fiction project. We'll see where it goes. Have you shown the book yet to like colleagues at your law firm, if you work at a law firm, I know, or like friends, close friends, anybody who was really surprised by it? Or like, what have some of the reactions been? I mean, obviously, I'm sure they all love it. But I mean, was there a yeah. part of you that you feel like re- was represented in the book or just like thoughts and feelings or whatever that you feel in any way uncomfortable sharing or that was, re- or the people responded in a way you weren't hoping for or any of that or not really? I mean, it's only been shared at this point with, I don't know, a couple dozen people maybe because we're still early. And for the most part, the reaction has been amazing. Yeah. I, you know, again, it's, it's, I, I stress to people, especially people close to me, that it's not me. It's not my story. And I think most people have just focused on the, on the, you know, hopefully the work of art, the, the, the work itself. And some people have been watching this journey of mine, this writing journey for a long time now. So they are a little less surprised. And others who haven't really seen this yet are, yeah, there's a few, there's, <laughs> there's some, shocked faith, some shocked looks out there, which is kind of fun. It also is nice. I feel very lucky for, the, for whatever failure I've had in the years before this, because I think some of the stuff I wrote earlier while I'm proud of it, and I'm talking more about fiction now as opposed to some of the screenplays, but some of the fiction, you know, I was proud of it at the time, but it just wasn't quite ready. It just wasn't there. But you keep growing, you keep learning, and then, and then this book I'm, I really love. And so um, it's very, I'm very glad that for most people, the first thing they get to see is this. So the reactions so far have been great. We'll, we'll, see, how, we'll see how it goes, but yeah. I feel like a lot of people are looking for great screenwriters now. I feel like for so many books, people are like needing screenwriters to adapt them and all the rest. But now, since you are already have award-winning screenplay, you could just adapt your own book. <laughs> Possibly. And we have a great film agent who's, who's pitching the, the book around right now. And we talked about it. I mean, I think, I think we would love to get you know, very experienced screenwriter to adapt this. Uh, I think it's a little, it's going to be a cool challenge to adapt it. And I like my screenwriting. I'm very proud of it. But I'm also, I haven't been doing it for 20 years. So if we could get, you know, an established screenwriter to do it, that would be, that would be thrilling. Yeah. And just tell me the moment, like when you first sold this book or the first like biggest piece of great news related to this book, like what was that moment like? Like, did you hear about it on the phone or email or like, were you jumping up and down? Like- <laughs> yeah, no, it was, it was head spinning, honestly. You know, I, I've been writing for a while. This book in particular, I've been working on for basically three years. So about a year of creation and crafting and structuring and then two years of writing. And then I took a month off, just did nothing. And then I started sending out query letters. I didn't have an agent at the time. And it was head spinning because I think in about four weeks, I have this written down somewhere, but I think in about four weeks, I went from my first call with my now agent to the hand, you know, the deal with Harper. And it was, it was incredibly fast for whatever reason. And it all went great. And, but it was, I didn't sleep well for four weeks. It was just that crazy for, it was just crazy. So I guess, but, but to answer your question, the, I mean, the really, I mean, those, there were a lot of big moments in there. 
but I obviously the two biggest ones were when, when Doug, my agent first got on the phone and just told me how much he loved it and said, I definitely want to be a part of this. And that was enormous to me, just enormous. I mean, cause I, he was one of those, he was one of the people I really wanted to work with. I mean, there was a handful of people at the top of my list and he was one of them. So that was already, I don't think I jumped up and down, but I was, I was pretty excited. <laughs> and then, you know, three, four weeks later when Sarah and, Har- and Harper said, yeah, we want it. I mean, yeah, that whole month was just insane. Wow. So exciting. Do you have any advice to aspiring authors? God, I mean, there's so much, right? But I guess if I had to distill it and be pithy, I would say, at least for me, what's been really important to me at a high level is to keep learning and keep persisting. And I can't tell you how important that's been for me in, in my journey. I mean, you don't have to be that pithy. You could, you could, you could expand a little bit. <laughs> well, there's, there's, there's so much. I mean, I think, you know, I, I wrote something years ago that I really love, but now, years later, I look back on it and I realize it's, it's so green. I mean, so I think keep learning. And I, I don't have a formal MFA. So my learning was through, it was informal. Some very great, some great writing workshops some great writing seminars. But I just kept doing that, kept doing that. And I also kept learning the way I have my whole life, which is through books. I'll expand on that by saying there are two key books that I think that I can share with you that, that for me, they're just very critical. One is The Art of Fiction by John Gardner. And then the other is actually more, it's focused on screenwriting, but it's really for any story. It's called Story by Robert McKee. And those two books had a profound influence on how I write, how I tell stories. And it was a matter of, you know, continuing to learn and never thinking that I knew what I was doing. And then the persistence, you just can't, you can't say it enough. You can say it three times because I think for, for a lot of people I know trying to create, including me now, you just, you're going to continually hit doubt and, and those places where you don't know what you're doing, you don't know how to fix something and you just, you just keep going. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thank you for this amazing book. So beautifully written, so thought provoking, and I'm really excited to see it launch into the world. Uh, thank I'll be, you. I'll be much. rooting for you. <laughs> well, thank you. Thanks so much. Well, it's great to be here. Thanks again for listening to my podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. If you liked this episode, please follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books and sign up for my mailing list at zibbyowens.com so you can always hear about the latest things I'm up to. Thanks a lot. This episode has been sponsored by The Helm, thehelm.co, a lifestyle brand committed to elevating and investing in female entrepreneurs with tons of products by women founders. Definitely go check them out. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. Thanks for listening. You could always email me at zibby at zibbyowens.com. Mm-hmm.